happy Sunday. As we continue in worship, you can remain standing. I just want to introduce to you a familiar face to us, but officially, this is Daniel Herr. He is going to be interning with us this semester as our worship intern here at Carroll Stream Campus. We are so blessed to have him, and he's going to lead us in this next song. All right, this morning we're going to sing of his faithfulness. Can we do that? Can we do that? Let's put our hands up. I saw darkness run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders, I have resurrection power, still the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven my praise belongs to you forever yeah. this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony. This is my testimony. Let's put our hands up back in the air. Come on, sing. Come together. Come together, sons and daughters. Up with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. We'll finish what we start. Do we believe that this morning? Our God will finish what we started. Yeah. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. Come on, see that. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
Good morning. I just had that moment where I'm like, did I leave my phone downstairs or is it in the pocket? So we'll make it work. We are so glad you are here joining us today. And uh, one of the moments we get to do is participate in people, life transformation and following Jesus. And so two ordinances of our church we follow is, of course, communion that talks about his death, burial, resurrection, but also baptism. Uh, baptism is a picture of that as well. Not that anything in here saves you. It is the confession that you believe what Jesus has done for you. And then that becomes uh, the heart, the, the, the heartbeat in which you follow in your life of how he died, buried, and rose again. And in that, what baptism is for us, it is an outward expression of our inward change. But that change being you now want to follow Jesus Christ with your whole life. And in obedience to the scriptures, you now want to take that step of baptism. And so today we get to do that with uh, one of our members of the Serving Our Kids Ministry, wonderful family. Would y'all help me celebrate Jennifer as she comes out to take her step in following Jesus. Amen. We are so excited for this day to happen in your, in your walk and your faith and you got two beautiful reasons why with your children looking you on, cheering mom on as she dedicates her life deeper to Jesus. So, Jennifer, we asked three questions, two questions, and then once you uh, answer the following. Number one, do you believe in Jesus, the Son of God, who died, buried, and rose again? Yes. And by faith, have you trusted him to be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Jennifer, tell us today, why do you want to be baptized? I want to participate in the sacrament of baptism to demonstrate my convictions that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and that I'm committed to following him and his teachings. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray for you and your family uh, that your walk will grow ever deeper and closer uh, with the Lord. Uh, this is a powerful moment when people make their decisions to say, I want to publicly proclaim my love and affection for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As a church, here's what we do. We, we spur them on. We pray for them. And we do all that we can as the body of Christ to make sure we be conduits of people finding and following would you pray with me? Lord, it is such a powerful reminder of how the gospel brings transformation. We no longer look the same. We have a new way of walking and talking and new habits. And our affections are now set on the things of Christ. Lord, we pray that is true for Jennifer and someday when her kids come to the age of understanding fully the gospel, they too would declare their love and affection for Jesus. I pray God that you protect her, that you keep her, that you hedge your protection around her, that her new walk with you may be life-giving, may forever change in it. She's already shown examples of how she's following you. Lord, we celebrate the work that you've done on the cross that's brought us our freedom and sealed our hope to come. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Let's stand as we proclaim that. Uh, if I'm not dead, you're not done. Let's sing this together. I'm not dead and you're not done. When the things are still to come, oh, I believe. If I'm not dead and you're not done. to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Come on, let's sing it out. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. Y'all ready? 
we're ready to sing this out. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is, this is my testimony. From death, come on, let's sing it out. Let's testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. for the salvation you brought us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All we got is to say thank you, Jesus. Let's put up our hands up in the air. Amen. Well, as we continue this morning, we've just had the beautiful picture of baptism to give us um, that, that image of someone going from death into life, amen, that, that we are buried in the likeness of his death and we're raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And as I was reading um, Romans chapter 6 this week, that came to mind. It says that you are dead to sin and alive to God. It says this, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. It says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. And I just thought about that this week. I was convicted by that. Am I really living as if I've been brought from death to life? Like, am I really actually living as if I'm in the life and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because if I'm honest, most days, I'm just trying to make it through the day. <laughs> just trying to get through, just trying to keep my cool, keep my patience. And I just was so convicted that, that this is not the way that God has called us to live from death to life and resurrection with the joy of the Lord as our strength, amen? And so as we continue in worship today, may that testimony of our baptism be, be an encouragement to us to remind us that we are called to the life of, of resurrection and that we can trust in God because he has given us assurance of that that his way is better, his way is good. Amen? So as we continue in worship, let that be our hope. Let's sing this next song together. in his blood and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough so I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail he will never fail Perfect submission. i 
proclaim out this testimony that no matter how many times we've sought him he has come and he has answered us let's sing this out together us courage to trust in him. He will never fail. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise and 
Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Sing that one more time. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I praise him more and more. Trust him more. Lord God, that is our prayer this morning, that you would be gracious to us as we seek to trust you deeper, Lord, that you give us the strength and the courage to lean in and to really surrender ourselves to you, God, that we might be people who have walked from death into life, that we might be people of the resurrection, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you would be glorified as we continue in worship. Lord, would you, would you speak to us, Lord? Would you set our hearts towards you? Would you convict us, Lord, of the things that are not of you? And would you turn us back to yourself? We thank you, Lord, that you are so precious and that it's so sweet to trust in you. We thank you that you are a good God and that you are faithful. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated and the kids are dismissed. morning. It is good to see you. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you to our worship team and you God's people lifting your voice in praise and glory to a God who is good. And there are times in your life, <clears throat> in our lives, where maybe we can't hold truth to those words or at least can't see it. Uh, but we know they hold truth in the person and the work of who God is. And so, uh, today, if you are new with us, we are uh, walking through a series called Rooted, uh, and Rooted is a small group curriculum our small group leaders have been studying, and we've turned now into a preaching series, uh, and in that, we try to follow the topics that's being discussed uh, weekly, and so uh, it's more of a topical, expositional uh, message today, and today, our topic is on the thought of suffering, on the thought of suffering, no, no easy topic. Uh, for you to hear, for you to experience, and for sure uh, for me to deliver. But here is the truth about suffering. Suffering is the terror of creation. It's the absolute hardship that it's not the way our creation and life is supposed to be. It is the terror of creation. But also in that suffering... What it does, it allows you and I, God's children, to be developed in the lab of Christian maturity. It is, it is the moment where you and I see God and his character and his love and his truth and his uh, comfort around you and I. It is the development lab for the believer, one of the processes for photographer. It's when they call it the dark room, where they take photos and to edit these photos. They call it uh, photo manipulation, where they have to edit what they saw. And in this dark room, it's, it's revealed or it's processed, and it goes into uh, a, a solution. And from solution, it's hung dry. And from there, you can manipulate the things that's supposed to be, and in and out and in and out. And the best work for that photographer is done in the dark room. And believer, for you and I, there are dark room moments in our life where it develops the very person and Christian we are as the creator develops us. 
Because this is the truth about life. Life can be tough. Life can be full of stress. Life can be full of disappointments, of heartaches, of hurts, of pains, of loss, of sickness and diseases, of chaos and disorder, and disorder, which all are a part of the human condition. Matter of fact, and we should not uh, be alarmed when we go through that. Jesus told us in John 16, 33, as he told his disciples, he says this, in this world, you will have trouble. But on the back of that trouble, he says, but don't worry, have hope at the end of the day because I've already overcome all of the trouble, all of the sufferings, all of the pain, all of the sin, all of the chaos because I've already overcome the world. And we could spend a lot of time right there talking about the sovereignty of God and we can all scratch our heads and leave with a headache if we did that, the sovereignty of God and human response. Because what we do know about our God who created the foundations of the earth knows all things, guides all things, directs all things. He knows our now, our next, and our future before we even know our next minute. He is sovereign over it all. And our response as humans then is to really develop a greater sense of dependence, a deeper sense of dependence for him. What happens is we all live through suffering, and this suffering looks different for every single one of us, but maybe it's the moment where you experience the disappearance of the one you love, and you hoped the outcome would be different. Maybe you feel like life right now is absolutely fruitless, and the moment of failure or the feeling of failure is upon you right now. So friends, hear me. Hear me when I say this, when we talk about this subject. Suffering is more than something you just get through. When people endure that, it's, they say, we'll just get through it on the other side. Yes, we know that. Yes, we know the truth about suffering. Suffering is more than just getting through it. Because here's what I do know about suffering. And here's what I want to give to us today. God is doing a million and one things in your suffering. He, he's working out countless details rather than you can ever think or imagine. And what we do not know, or while we do not know, or while we wait what he is doing, you do know this, that you belong to him. And that suffering is absolutely under his control. And suffering is a part of the very redemptive work that God is doing in the earth. And so dare I say, suffering is a gift. Suffering is a gift to see God's hand and his love and his compassion and his nearness and his heart towards his people, although it is hard. Now, friends, saints, what I'm saying is don't go out there looking for ways to suffer. Because that would be crazy. But because there is no greatest level to be achieved as a Christian when you do. You can still see the character of God and hold true to his word when you do not suffer. But what I do tell you, maybe while you choose the will of God, maybe while you do exactly what he has planned for you, the one thing you will experience is suffering. So here's the truth about suffering, friends. Suffering is never pointless but is a necessary tool that the Lord uses to refine, mature, and prepare us for fruitful service for his kingdom. We look more like him through suffering. Matter of fact, you look throughout scripture, you look throughout the Bible and church history, we see that God uses suffering to prepare and equip his servants for useful ministry. Again, if you're with us today, more of a topical message, I'll be bouncing back and forth with some scripture. I want to meet, meet me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul talks exactly what I just said, but he puts it uh, in better words than I, ha than I have said of suffering. In, in chapter 4, verse 8, he says this, we are. We are afflicted in every way. Every step of life, there will be some sense of suffering in every way, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, <clears throat> but not driven to despair. We're persecuted but not uh, forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. This is the norm, not the exception, but those who follow Jesus of our suffering servant. And suffering is a part of life. And so today, uh, I want to walk through this outline with you is the theology of suffering, the sources of suffering, and some biblical pictures of how we see suffering. So here's what I mean by the theology of suffering. See, it's Lewis, the problem of pain. This question has been asked for many years. Why, how do you endure 
this problem of pain. And there's two ways in what I call the theology of suffering that happens. Uh, category A is you suffer, and you suffer, and you suffer, and you die. And there is no hope. The mentality of people is just that. Well, since I'm already here, I'm just going to suffer, and I'm only going to suffer. And there you left hopeless, and you leave your loved ones hopeless. Or there's option number two, where you suffer, and you suffer. But with that suffering, you realize there is an absolute perfect plan and purpose, and you then live with hope. On the other side of suffering, friends, I got to draw us to what God tells us, that there is absolutely hope. And so for the believer, we don't live in category A. We live in category B. We identify that all of our suffering, whether it's marriage or health or finances or physical ailment or our economy or our world, there is hope at the end of our suffering. But while the pain is unavoidable, while the suffering seems to impact every way of your heart, you know what's optional? Misery. Because Camp A only lives in misery. Misery when you wake, misery when you go, misery when you sleep. For us, there is a joyful hope that no matter what circumstances we have, we have to choose to be joyful. And with joyful, that means we have to be looking ahead because we have absolute hope that all things, all things are going to work out. Let me talk through some of the sources of suffering. There's three sources of suffering that I want to bring to us, and the last one is where I want to hang my hat for a little while. Three, suffering, three sources of suffering. Number one is, is self. There are times where suffering is a direct impact of the decisions we have made. Now hear me. I do not say all suffering is because of self. But there are times where suffering is a direct impact of this correction and this discipline. Matter of fact, go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. At this point, Jesus uh, 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 Paul uh, is talking to the church of Corinth and telling them, uh, you, you're going to take communion unworthily without committing um, uh, your, your sins before the Lord. And in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 30 and 32, you, you read this. <clears throat> this is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, hear this next phrase, we are disciplined. So that we may not be condemned along with this world. There are times to where suffering is brought upon ourselves. Or you go over to Hebrews chapter, chapter 12. Now Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. A quotation from the Proverbs, of course, and it reads this. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastises every son. This is not in the sense of gender. This is God's children. He chastises every son whom he receives. There are times where sin, this reality of what it is, it is a serious rebellion against God's perfect order and plan. And what happens is it will eventually catch up with us. Sin is often hidden by us. But when it comes to the light, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a lot of things gets exposed. Matter of fact, you look back at Numbers chapter 32 and 23, the B part of that verse, and it says this, be sure <clears throat> that your sins will find you out. Now, friends, hear me. Now, all suffering is because of sin. We'll look at a passage later that deals with that, but it is sometimes, it is sometimes only through suffering that we can begin to listen to God. Where at that moment, our natural pride and our self-confidence have been painfully stripped away from us as we become aware of who he is, where in other cases or stances we may not. And so suffering at time gets the attention where it focuses us to look to God, otherwise we will ignore him. Because we reap what we sow both positively and negatively. Matter of fact, you want some biblical uh, uh, pictures? Look at Jonah. <clears throat> look at Saul. Look at the Israelites, God's chosen people. Time and time again, they had orders to obey, and they did exactly what they wanted to do, and they had to pay the consequences of that. What happens is when self-suffering is identified, you know what it should, should do? Lead us to immediate repentance, absolutely immediate repentance. That's number one. Number two, others. Others, because we live in a fallen world. 
we are impacted directly or indirectly by others' sin and fallenness and hurts and pains. Maybe a family member, maybe a choice that, that, that impacts you directly. It reminds me of the story of the newspaper reporter. He phoned in a story into his editor of how in the evening an empty truck had rolled down the hill and smashed into a home. After hearing the story, the editor was unimpressed, and he said, actually, I do not want to run this story. And the reporter says, well, I'm glad you're taking this so calmly because it was your house. <laughs> there are times where suffering <laughs> impacts you directly because of, of others. Our falling world, what God is doing during this time is redeeming all of the brokenness, all of the pain, all of the suffering that you and I have to deal with. The biblical character for that one is Joseph. And of course, God was doing something in Joseph's heart, but here's Joseph's brothers whom he so loved are now jealous, so much so they sell him into slavery and Joseph finds himself in a pit, in the pit, the bottom of the earth left there to die. Others cause that. And then you fast forward some of his story. He's now in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's uh, a wife makes this lie up to him. And now Joseph is now on the run. Sometimes suffering is caused because of others. But then this is the last one where suffering is caused. It's because of righteous living. And Jesus says, you will suffer for righteousness sake. We're in our lives just because you are walking the straight and narrow path. As a believer, you find yourself suffering what we find is suffering then can promote spiritual maturity and awakening. Matter of fact, James tells us this. James tells us that when we are called to meet all various trials of life, he tells us to do it with one thing. With joy. With joy. We suffer for the sake of righteousness so that those trials can build what James then would say, this steadfastness in us. And notice when you read that, that verse in James 1, 2, and 4, he does not uh, distinguish whether the, those trials are coming directly because of sin or response to another way we've committed or other. What he does say is in every kind of trial, every trial, he says your faith will be tested. You're going to have to look that decision in the face and your hope will now be on the teeter-totter of life. To say, am I hoping in my future or I'm going to spend my time right now hoping in only to what I see? He says, your faith is going to be tested. And the aim in every trial is to build the kind of steadfastness. And when we realize that, what we see in steadfastness is that God is trustworthy. And that God is wise. And that God is good. And that he is valuable. And that he is all sufficient, all sufficient for every situation you and I are in. Suffering, dear friends, suffering, dear friends, will produce a greater discovery of who God is. A greater discovery of who God is. Matter of fact, flip over to Job. You, you see here in, in Job's life, you know some of the story. I don't have time to go through it all, but I do want to highlight some of his life. You see Job is characterized in 1-1. In, in one, one. He was blameless and upright, who feared God, and he turned away from evil. You want to talk about suffering for the sake of righteousness? He turned away from all evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters, and he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. Fast forward the story a little bit. Satan now goes to God and says, hey, God, have you tried your servant Job? And, and God says, actually, go ahead and do it. Just do not touch him. And then you go down to verses 13 to the end of chapter 1, where you see now Job's property and his children are now taken from him. You flip over to chapter 2, you now see Job's health. The one thing we can't get back is health. Now Job's health is impacted by this suffering. And then you get to chapter 3, and Job feels the realness that suffering brings. You know what he does? He laments that he was born. He tells God, if this is what you're going to put me through, why was I even born? He laments his birth. And then later in Job chapter 42, verses 5 and 6, you see Job taking some moments to repent because it did bring some things to his heart. 
but two verses that, that captured me in verse chapter 5, verse 17. It's, it says this, Behold, blessed is the one who God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. And then you get to chapter 13. Job makes a bold statement. I think we live by today. Chapter 13, verse 15, he says this, Though he slay me, this idea is to cause great affliction and harm upon you. Though he slay me, Job says one thing that which we live in our theology of suffering as Christians, I will hope in him. The joy that is set before us is realizing that in all things, God is working all things to redeem our brokenness. And so friends, friends, the waltz of your suffering and sorrow will one day produce the dance of worship and praise. The waltz, this dance move, this, this square move that you do over and over and over again, the suffering and sorrow of life, marriage, financial, job, sickness, disease, sin, the waltz of suffering will one day turn to the dance of worship and praise. What do you mean, Tay? Flip over to Psalm chapter 30. It is there in Psalm chapter 30 where you find this absolute hope where joy uh, comes from. Look at verse uh, 11, or you can read this when you get home. It reads this, you have turned my mourning, my sadness, my sorrow, my sufferings into dancing. And when you did that, Lord, what you've done is you loose my sackcloth. This idea of sackcloth in the Old Testament, not only was this an inward emotion and sadness you were feeling, but it was also represented by what you wear. This, this somber, sadness, depression. He says, you loosed it and you closed me with gladness. Oh, friends, our suffering will not always last the way it does now. And there is truth to holding on to the hope we have because the waltz of suffering and sorrow will one day produce the dance of worship and praise. Suffering, it comes in every form of life. Tim Hansel says this in his book, You Gotta Keep Dancing in the Midst of Life's Hurts. He says this, he compared suffering to the experience uh, of life to a patchwork on a quilt. Now, I've never done patchwork on a quilt, but there seems to be some intention behind patchwork on a quilt. You don't want to use the same cuts and materials and patterns and colors. You want it to all look a little uh, uh, mingled and disjointed, and disjointed. But at the end of it, what you see is an absolute beautiful picture. Friends, our suffering is like patchwork on the quilt of life. Where God may use suffering A, B, and C and skip to K. And then from K, he uses Z. There is all of our sufferings that the Lord uses, and out of that comes absolutely something beautiful. But what about suffering when God gets the glory out of it? Flip over to John chapter 9. Uh, John chapter 9, suffering for righteousness' sake. You see Jesus describe how you suffer well and the reason behind it. In John chapter 9, Jesus now has been walking with his disciples. They've seen his work. And you know, in the book of John, you see more of Jesus' deity, his, the, his character of him being both God and man. And at this point in John chapter 9, look at the first uh, uh, verses. And as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, Rabbi, or Benai, what's the next phrase? Who sinned? As if all sufferings of life is only because you sin. That is absolutely wrong. Who sinned? This man or his parents? That he might be born blind. He is absolutely bo born blind. Jesus answered. Jesus answered. Oh, this is so good. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God or your scriptures may say that the glory of God might be revealed or displayed in him. Think about this story. This blind man is blind from birth. He's worried about no glory of his own. In that time, he's an outcast. In that time, he has to sit away from the others. 
There's no glory in this stuff. Jesus says, you know why he is born blind? So that the glory of God may be revealed. And friends, there are some times in our suffering where God sends suffering to magnify God in us and in others. And when we have that moment, what happens is this man holds true and God tells him to go and wash and he goes and wash and he gets his healing. What he does is he endures exactly the test God puts him through. And in those sufferings, in those sufferings, God brought healing upon him. John Piper says it best this way. He says this, every sting in life is appointed and managed by a loving father toward our final glory. It's a quote that punches you in the gut. That that makes you realize, wait a minute, God. All that I'm experiencing is appointed by you. There are reasons why people have walked away from the faith because they've asked the problem of pain. The question is, how could a good God, how could a loving father draw so near to us but allow bad things to happen? And then for the Christian, they put all that pressure on us as if the Muslims don't suffer, as if the Gnostics don't suffer, as if the nuns or the duns don't suffer. We all suffer. It's all a part of life. Piper says the sting, that reaction is like an ouch, the physical, the sting of life. And I wish he would have translated that word, the sufferings of life is managed and appointed by God. This shapes the very theology of suffering we have in God. That the sovereignty of God has appointed this suffering to us, but then on the other side, this idea of it being managed, that he takes care of all of the details. That he takes care of all of the future moments and all of the tomorrow moments. He manages all. And here's why. Because it produces in us a final good. We have a final good to come. But in the middle of that, you have to choose how you respond to suffering. So here's the responses to suffering people have done throughout the years. Avoidance or ignorance. Absolute deep bitterness. Unbelief bodily harm or addictions, this idea of, well, I begrudgingly live every day when I wake up, when I walk, when I drink, everything is sorrow and sadness because of what God has done for me, to me. There's anger and there's agitation. There's questioning of what does this all mean? Is God cruel? Is God out to get me? And the famous question, of course, of why. And there's some that leads to absolute despair. But for us, friends, in our suffering, you know what it leads to? Hope and belief. This is the idea where you cling to the unwavering promises of who God is. Matter of fact, how did Paul handle it? Read this when you get home in your quiet time in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul, he writes about a, a recent severe trial, and he says this. He says, the troubles we experience, he said, he says, they are great pressures. If if Piper is right, that the sting of life will work out, he says they are great esteemed pressures far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. There are responses to suffering to where life itself, maybe we act like uh, Job in chapter 3, lamented we ever lived. He goes on, but he says this, this happened that we may not rely on ourselves, but that, friends, we rely on on God, the God who comforts us in all. You know the Greek word for all? All. (laughs) That God will comfort us in all trouble so that we may comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we receive from ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 4. And then Paul later goes and he writes to the Philippians in chapter uh, 4, verses 4 through 12, of the great encouragement it is to stand in the fight because he received the encouragement from the Lord himself so that we then share with others. And so, friends, here's what Paul encouraged my heart this week. And this is how I uh, uh, came away with that point as I walked through the text this week my own self. Here's what I came up with. Trust God when we do not understand him. Because the will of the Lord is perfect. And wrestle with that. 
wrestle until you can say that. You wrestle with God. You seek God. You cry to God. Trust him. His will is perfect. And wrestle with that until you can say that. Older friends, this hit us this week like a ton of bricks. Whereas you guys and we have been praying for a move of God and a miracle of God to bring healing on Samantha, friends, we do not yet see it. As we went for scans on Monday, got the results back on Wednesdays, our hearts broke with the devastating news that there is no change in the cancer. Matter of fact, it's gotten worse. New signs and symptoms. New areas. How could this awful disease wreak such havoc for one who lives a life pleasing to God? And yet, Paul, you say, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we rely not on ourselves, but rely on God. The statement is true for you. From Wednesday night up until last night, which will probably happen the rest of the week, can't sleep. I've never been so restless in my life, church. Restless. The fear of losing the one I love. And as I expressed that from the dinner table, they're in a corner of our home. All I hear God's daughter say, I only have peace about it. And you can have peace. In the perfect will of God, There are times where it's going to be a role where you have to wait and you have to wrestle until you get there. But you know what he does, friends? God strengthened us. As Paul says, I will not boast in anything else. He says this, I, po- I boast gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, he is strong. Second Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. God says he may not give Paul the deliverance. Paul is praying that he would remove the thorns in his flesh. This came to my heart this week. Say God may not give the living you want now, but there is a living to come. Samantha is going to live now, and she's going to live later. Her living Looks very different as she is wrapped in Christ. And Paul says, hey, you may not get the deliverance you want now, but I'll give you something greater. The grace of knowing my presence and my power. Oh, friends, what we face in suffering is God's presence and God's power. Not that we rely on ourselves, but that we may rely on him. And then Paul says, you want something to boast in, friends? You want something to boast in while you suffer? Boast in that. Boast in knowing that to have confidence and trust in God's will, despite the circumstances, that you are confident to trust that God is always good and he is wise and he has not abandoned you or or he does not understand you. That marriage that's maybe at the brink of divorce, the health crisis that has now affected your total body. The injury, the wayward family member, the job crisis where there's no money but you got a lot of month left, where there is the crash of mental health and depression, what you hold on to is you boast in the confidence and trust that despite my circumstances, God is good and God is wise and God is near and God is faithful. And then you can't go through suffering, friends, without looking at the perfect example of suffering. And that is the suffering of Jesus. That is the suffering of Jesus who decided to step out of heaven to come down to the chaos of earth. To redeem mankind. To love us and to save us from our sins. And at that moment, what Jesus now has done there in the garden of Gethsemane, he finds himself just in agony and exhausted so much that he is crying and he is sweating drops of blood. And then he goes on, he takes these beatings after beatings after beatings. And then he goes to a cross where he is absolutely murdered. And then he goes to a grave. And there in that grave, it was lonely and it was dark. But then we find victory there on the Sunday morning. 
Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, it says this, In the days of his flesh, referring to Jesus, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Watch this last part of this verse. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Friends, we learn obedience by looking at the example of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Because here is the truth of that. Uh, Christians, the entire belief for us rests upon one thing, Jesus' resurrection. And there at that resurrection, this established our hope for our life now and the afterlife to come. And that is not mere theory. That is not fairy tale. That is a lie because if it was, then all Christianity crumbles. But if it is true, which it is, it happened then that the Christian message points us to a world that will be recreated with a new reality. It points us to another place to where all of the diseases, where all of the sufferings, where all of the pains, where all of the loss, where all of the sadnesses will be this foundation of joy. And this prize provides for us today a present hope. And this present hope is not in ourselves, but this present hope is in knowing that God is going to make all things right. And so, friends, look not at your circumstances. Oh, no, we don't. We look not at our circumstances for stability or for satisfaction. You know what we do? We lean on the love of the Father who works all things for our good, for his children. Regardless of the trial you face and that you may be experiencing now, you pray and you labor. Friends, there will be a time very soon where we will probably have to stop the work and start to pray only by itself. There's this thing of work and pray. And right now for Sam and I, we are in the middle of that. We're doing all we can of laboring, but he continued on to say, pray, pray, pray that the Lord will reveal his suffering to us. And so the question we ask, does God want something good for me in suffering? Yes. Will God get the glory from my sufferings? The answer is yes, friends, because our patience is developed. Yes, because we will be forced to find joy. Yes, because our mindset changes to the future glory. Yes, because our trust in God is strengthened. Yes, because we learn more about bearing burdens and laying down our sins. Yes, because it makes us look more like Jesus in our suffering. Will God get the glory out of this? Yes, he will. It reminds me of the story of a missionary in India who saved all these young ladies from sex trafficking. And as he did that, he gave them a new life. And in that new life, he also taught them the trade. He taught them how to make jewelry. And in jewelry, he was showing them how he fashions the material. He puts it in the fire. And so one day, the story goes, is they're around the fire, and he's putting the jewelry in, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And one of the girls said, well, how, why are you doing that? He says, because the fire refines you and pours out all the impurity so that the metal is shaped and fashioned. And so he goes back to doing it again and doing it again. And although they thought their question was answered, one bold girl says, but, but when do you know it's complete? When do you know the jewelry is done? And he lifted it up. And he looked at it. He says, you know it's done when the jeweler can see its face in the design. Would you let that sit? Our suffering is to produce that the one who created us, that we may look more like him as we go in and out of the sufferings of life, of the hardships of life, of the pains of life. You go back over to Psalm 34, and then I, I had moved to a close. He says, Beloved, your weeping may endure for a night, but know this, on the other side of weeping, there is going to be joy. Your joy will be made complete. What you face now, although it is hard, hear me, saints, what you face now, and God only knows what you are walking through as you sit in these seats or as you watch this online, although it's hard, it does not compare to the future glory that is to come. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18, it says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worth to even compare to the glory that is to be revealed to us for. Our whole creation is longing for this recreation, for this new reality. And then in verse 23, he says, and so are you. So are you, saint? One day it is going to be made right. Tim Keller, one of my favorite pastors, theologians now in glory after passing away from cancer, he writes in this book, uh, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, he says this. He says, suffering is at the very heart of the Christian faith. It is not only the way Christ became like and redeemed us, but it is one of the many ways we become like him and experience his redemption. And that means that our suffering, despite its painfulness, is also filled with purpose and usefulness. And if Keller is right, if he is now in glory, we also hold to the fact that our present sufferings are going to be way less comparable to the future that is ahead of us. And so, Kay, what does this mean for us? How do I steward my sufferings well? Uh, how do you steward the sufferings you have now, or have had, or yet to come? How did you, how do you steward well? And I pray to God we don't get a suffering this evening when the Packers beat the Bears. How do we steward well? Number one, don't run from them. Do not run from them. There is something about anchoring down. The song we sang before this about how we trust in Jesus in every season. It's going to anchor us to the ground. Do not run from those sufferings. Number two, you stop and you address your feelings and your emotions. Uh, our emotions and feelings are great indicators for us in life. They tell us things. They tell us if we feel lonely and sad and there's this despair, is this de depression, is this anger. Stop and feel those because guess what? God can handle them all. He's not saying, whoa, 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 that's too much. I can't take that right now. Give it to me in chunks. He handles them all. So stop and address your feelings and emotions. Uh, number three, find a healthy community is the idea where you do not, you do not suffer alone, dear brother, dear sister. You find a healthy, healthy community. Number four, you realign with the truth of the scriptures and the character of God. You, you have absolute hope and faith to what we know from the pages of these words, who God is to us. Because the truth is, for those who know the path of God, you also can find that path of God in the dark. For those who know the path, you can find the, the God in the dark. And then number five, remember that your future is good. And I say this, friends, with all faith and sincerity to the scripture. This is no prophetic lie. This is not just for sound bites. This is knowing that in Christ Jesus, your future looks greater than anything you have now. He's already overcome it. He's already invited us into this life that is life-giving. And one day, the scripture says, when the trumpet sound and the voice of God will cry with a voice of triumph, all of God's people, for those who love and believe him, oh, dear brother, dear sister, there is going to be a heavenly sound, a heavenly music, a heavenly worship where all of God's people will get together. If you can't get past your now, remember that your future looks absolutely I want to pray this prayer. I wrote this in the wee hours of the morning when I was restless and couldn't sleep. And maybe it doesn't give me encouragement, but it did for me, and I want to pass it on. I ask God this. I say, God, with the eye of faith, may you help me not to look at the temporal, but at the eternal. That I may find the secret of my true satisfaction, contentment, comfort, and hope in sufferings. All I need is the eye of faith. Not a flesh, but a faith. If that prayer is real for you today, here's what we're going to do. 
Our worship team is just going to close this out with a bridge of a song. I, I know as you hear this or have walked through this in your life, you have walked or walking through a tough season. I, I want to pray with you. I'm going to ask our elder Dave, too, when we start the song to come on this side, and we're going to pray with you. And the only thing that we want to pray is, of course, your prayer request, but as Jesus tells us, that if you come to me heavy, and if you give me your burdens, Jesus puts a promise on the end of that. I'm going to take you, and I'm going to yoke this thing up with you. For his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Friends, wherever you sit, and friends, as I said, first service, I don't want to curate a moment that is not there. I don't play with God, and I don't play with spiritual things. And so I'm not trying to make a moment, if it does not need to be a moment, but if you feel within yourself, if you feel within the seasons of life that you are walking through the heartache and the pain, the sadness and the brokenness, you need to come and put that burden to God right now, and I want to pray with you as we do that. Lord, give us the eyes of faith to not look at the temporal, to look at the eternal, that we may find hope, comfort, how we handle our sufferings as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. something in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you. Uh, Sam, here's what we're going to do. Sam, would you come? And we as your church family are just going to pray. 
We need God to do a miracle. And it's going to be by miracle or by medicine. And all I ask is that we trust God to do the work. Would you extend a hand where you are? I'm going to lift you and then we're going to lift up our dear sister. God, we confess our need for you. Our desire to see living here on this land. But Lord, you promised that we have life after this. And we live a better life after. But Lord, until then, until the now but not yet, we need you to work. We need a miracle. You're already working, but Lord, our request is that you do the miracle of healing in her body. I pray, Lord, you strengthen her days. I pray you strengthen her body, her mind, her heart, her psyche, her emotions, her faith. Lord, may she find the character of God in a new way. I pray you go before us as we go to all these doctors and specialists and our great need to hear their wisdom and their knowledge. And Lord, would you give us peace for every decision we make? You get the glory. You get the praise. And our trust is deeply in you. This we pray in Jesus' name. May God bless you and may God keep you.